Hi, everyone, and welcome once again to a Country First Conversation. We're excited to continue this brand new series that will allow you the chance to participate and be a part of the conversation in choosing country over party. Now, following the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th, Congressman Adam Kinzinger launched the movement Country First as a home for principled Americans who are simply tired of the poisonous extremism that has overtaken our beloved nation's politics. So if you haven't joined the movement, there's plenty of time. We invite you to come along for the ride. Visit the website. Go to countryfirst.com. That's with a one ST in the URL, countryfirst.com. Our most recent video shows Adam talking about fear and its impact on our politics today. It is a very powerful video, so if you get a chance, take a moment to take a look and make sure you like and subscribe to see all of our videos and content today. Again, that's at countryfirst.com. My name is Matt Rodewald, and I will be hosting today's conversation. Joining me this afternoon, Representative Adam Kinzinger from Illinois. He is a six-term congressman whose district is drawn like a boomerang around the Chicagoland area. So if you're going from Wisconsin and hooking down towards Indiana, it's like the tri-state tollway of districts. If you're from the Midwest, you'll understand that uh, reference. Also with us this afternoon is Peter Weiner. He's a writer through and through, an accomplished author of books like The Death of Politics and provocative pieces that you will see in The Atlantic and The New York Times. He spent time working in the Reagan and Bush White Houses, now doing work as a senior fellow for the Ethics and Public Policy Center in D.C. and with the Trinity Forum as well. Peter, Adam, welcome. Good afternoon, guys. My man, good to be with you. How are you? Doing very well. Let's start tonight with the idea of moving on from party leaders. It's not the easiest thing to do, of course. The transition after this past election is one that we are all never going to forget. The question is, where do we go from here? It's been asked before. Peter, let's start with you because you've worked in two Bush White Houses. You worked in the Reagan era as well. And 1992 stands out to me in terms of that transition. What was that transition from the Bush era to Clinton like for you and for insiders as well in D.C.? It's great to be with you, Matt, and Representative Kinzinger. Um, thanks for, for having me. Uh, in terms of the transition in, in um, 92, um, that was an interesting one because, uh, you know, George H.W. Bush was really a third Reagan term. Um, and the party by that point um, was intellectually tired. And Bill Clinton understood that. Um, Clinton, it should be said, was an interesting figure for the Democrats, and there may be something for Republicans to learn from him, right, which is that Democrats from 72 up until 88 had been crushed in several elections. The only one that they won was in 76 with Jimmy Carter, which was a razor thin margin, and that was because of Watergate. So the Democratic Party uh, figured out after uh, getting slaughtered in 80 and 84 and 88 that they had to go in a different direction. So Bill Clinton rose up and he ran as a new Democrat and he recast the Democratic Party. And that was the right moment to do it because at the same time that there was uh, kind of torpor or intellectual entropy in the Republican Party, uh, Clinton came forward, moderated the party and offered a new Democrat agenda. And then throughout the 1990s, uh, because there was not a Republican president, um, it, was, uh, it was an open field. And in, in the 90s, Newt Gingrich was the primarily the, I would say intellectual, architect uh, of the Republican Party. We saw that in the 94 midterm when they uh, took Republicans took the House for the first time in, uh, in, in decades. Um, and he came forward with a contract uh, for America. Uh, but it was a rocky tenure uh, for, for, for Gingrich. And, you know, he resigned in, in the late 90s. Um, and then when George uh, W. Bush won the nomination in 2000, he ran not only against uh, the Bill Clinton legacy in terms of the, the scandal of Monica Lewinsky, but he also pushed back against the Gingrich era because there was a counter reaction to that. So the 90s, I would say, was, was an open field. There was a lot of fluidity. And when that happens, it creates the opportunity for political leaders to rise up and articulate their own vision of where a party should go. I'll tell you what's, what's interesting to me, by the way, Peter, as you were talking, is I was, uh, when Bill Clinton was rolling for his first election, I would have been something like 13 or 14. And I was paying attention. I had a buddy that uh, told me at one point, he's like, I'm going for this guy, Bill Clinton. I was in sixth grade and uh, nobody had really even heard of Clinton. He was this kind of obscure candidate at first. And actually, I, I was convinced for a while that Pete Buttigieg would actually would have followed that model of kind of coming from, which he kind of did, but, you know, he obviously didn't win the presidency. But 
it was always interesting to me to see, you know, to see where the Republicans went after that. And I think you're right, the Gingrich reaction and the one thing, too, about W, um, which, you know, gets forgotten. I mean, he ran on this idea, you know, of course, of compassionate conservatism and talked about, you know, the soft bigotry of low expectations and the idea of, you know, no child left behind. And and I think because of the war, you know, unfortunately in 9-11, a lot of that got lost. But he really, really was the kind of compassionate candidate that I think, you know, the Republican Party can benefit from. Yeah, that's right. That that was a real theme of, of his. And it had resonance um, in the 2000 primary. And you're quite right. Once 9-11 happened, um, he he uh, he became a foreign policy um, president, and the domestic agenda was 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 overshadowed. It was actually interesting, Adam, that in during the uh, 2000 um, convention speech that that uh, that George W. Bush gave, they had to try and figure out what was the what was the thematic to hit because the country was at peace because of the dot com bubble and some other things. The economy was going strong, so it wasn't self evident what what the agenda was going to uh, was going to be. But he was definitely focused as a domestic policy president in his first inaugural uh, was was focused on that too. But um, in the blink of an eye, that changed. It's interesting to hear the history. It and you know what's what's we talk about you know, 92, and it set the door for, set the table for a contract with America uh, in 1994. And then 2008 occurred. And well, Adam, your, your involvement in American politics comes directly out of that transition out of 08 with the Tea Party movement. And how do you look back now and how that kind of walked yourself into, you know, Congress in some sense about what the feeling was and what the identity of the party was trying to be and those two factions you sort of saw then? Yeah, I mean, keep in mind, in uh, 2008, you know, our candidate was John McCain. Um, and actually, what people forget is McCain was ahead for quite a while. Well, I don't know for quite a while, but there was a point at which he took the lead. It was after the announcement of uh, Sarah Palin and a few other things. Remember the commercial about Barack Obama being the biggest celebrity in the world and and that kind of stuff. And, and you know, and but look, the, I, I think there's a very good lesson from Barack Obama's first run which was the country was hungry for optimism at that moment. I remember a ton of Republican friends that would have Obama signs in their yard. You know, I'd engage with them like, well, what is it about? Well, you know, we just, it's time for some optimism. And I think that's a lesson for today when we kind of sit here, you know, in our, in our silos and just worried that, you know, my goodness, it's always going to get worse. And, you know, the, the new model to get elected is using fear as the as the compelling factor to do that. The country just 12 years ago voted for a candidate based on optimism and uh, and and I think looks for that. But in terms of my role, you know, look, I came back from Iraq and I was there in 08 and 09. And and I remember uh, President Obama saying, you know, hey, we got to leave Iraq. And uh, and for me, that was a, a no, no, because I went through in the surge and I saw the difference between 08 and 09, the surge in Iraq. Side note, one of the bravest political decisions ever made by a president of the United States was the surge in Iraq, because George W. Bush had even leaders in the military telling him it's time to cut our losses and leave. And he this is where it talks where I think leadership is so important is he took that and said, no, I'm not going to do it. What, you know, we're going to double down. And frankly, the surge worked. And, uh, um, but anyway, so I, I knew that if we would have left Iraq quickly, that, uh, actually what ended up happening later would happen. Something like an ISIS would rise up. And, uh, so that's what compelled me to run. And, you know, the tea party really was getting started. And I think what a lot of people miss is that the tea party then and the tea party now were very different entities. You know, when I started to run the tea party was like, um, you know, it was, there were, I think 10,000 people that showed up to one event I, that they were doing. And, you know, thousands of people everywhere. And then when we took the majority, they kind of all went home and said, good, we did what we needed to. And uh, we achieved what we needed to. And then, you know, turned around and, and uh, um, you know, went home. And I think those that stayed, there were like, you know, a small cadre, of maybe one or 2% of those Tea Partiers that stuck around. And they changed what the movement was about, I believe. You know, I never committed, for instance, to never raise the debt limit. That's a stupid commitment because you got to just pay your bills, like paying your credit card. Uh, But they became all about never raise the debt limit. And I have so many stories, but I'll leave you on this one and we continue with that. I remember after the day after I was elected in 2010, 
they I went maybe it was a couple days later I went and did military duty and I flew and I landed and when I turned on my phone it was exploding and with emails voicemails you know texts etc people telling me I had to go to this certain orientation I'm like what is this and I found out that some tea party group leaked all our cell phones and personal data and we were being inundated that we couldn't go to the quote unquote establishment you know uh, introductory course or whatever the orientation we had to go to the tea party one and that was that was a defining line about whether you're tea party or not that's when everything changed peter jump in here i mean <laughs> it's a fascinating story yeah the, those are great stories i just one thing on the surge uh, and i mean i agree with you uh completely that was actually one of the really impressive and courageous decisions by a president that i've seen because on the surge, um, because the headwinds were uh, were enormous against uh, President Bush for doing that. And in fact, uh, Mitch McConnell came to uh, the Oval Office, I think it was for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with President Bush in 2006, and basically argued to get out of Iraq because he thought that staying in and the surge uh, would hurt Republican prospects. And Bush just about threw him out of the office um, and said that he wasn't going to make a decision on national security based on political um, considerations. And the surge was actually one of the really um, textbook turnarounds in military strategy. Petraeus uh, on the military side and Ryan Crocker on the diplomatic side did a phenomenal job. You'll know more about it than, than I because of your, your background. But that, that was really impressive in terms of the Tea Party. I quite agree. I mean, I think the the it's it's odd, right? In one way, the Tea Party itself has 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 disappeared uh, as a as a party. Certainly, it's to the degree that there was a policy or philosophical um, uh, center of gravity to the Tea Party, which was limited government. That's been that's been jettisoned. The Trump years, whatever they were, and we can go into those if you want. They were not a period of limited government, either in practice or even in rhetoric. Um, but I think the way, so that is gone, that Tea Party element, at least for now. What's not gone and why the Tea Party was in some respects, um, I think, a foreshadowing of where we are now in the Trump era was it was a populist, an angry populist movement, um, which was at its core anti-elitist um, and as Adam's story tells, anti-establishment. Um, and so there was this growing anger and fury at the uh, at the so-called establishment uh, that wasn't really uh, always anchored in reality. Um, and if you listen to talk radio in the late 2000s, early 2010s, those were canary in the coal mine because you were almost as likely if you listen to somebody like Mark Levin or Rush Limbaugh at that time, you were almost as likely to hear criticisms of John Boehner and Mitch McConnell as Barack Obama. More likely, and, I think, even. Yeah, and, and you know, for, for most of Limbaugh's career, the, the binary was liberal conservative. That began to shift to establishment and anti-establishment around the middle part of the 2000s, and it just grew and grew and grew. And um, populism can be an important movement. It can be a useful corrective to conservatism, but they're not the same thing. And populism at some point becomes antithetical to conservatism, and the founders themselves and Lincoln warned about populism, about untamed passions, about the about passions uh, overtaking reason. And that's always a danger in a, in a, in a democracy. Um, and that's the reason we have the, the type of government that we have. I, I do think that uh, populism has uh, sort of jumped the rails here in recent, uh, in recent years, and we're paying a price for it. Yeah, and I'll tell you too, like, you know, when, when you talk about leadership, not to go back to the surge, but I think it's an important point, is all the polls, everything said, get out of Iraq, don't do the surge, right? You know, John McCain, to his credit, had been advocating hard continually. Um, he made the, the popular phrase, which is why I had so much respect for him, too, is, uh, and I told him this because I became close to him. Uh, before he passed, but I, he said, you know, I'd rather lose an election than lose a war. And to me, it's not about the war. Like that, that statement's not about the war, but it's about somebody that's willing to put it all on the line. And when I voted, you know, to impeach, if you look at, you know, the comments and stuff that people make, I mean, some people that were against impeachment go, well, your district doesn't want you to do it. And while I would agree that the base doesn't, I'm not sure if that, you know, held water for the whole district, but regardless, 
the reason we have to swear on an oath to protect and defend the Constitution and not the other 700,000 people in my district is because you have a unique responsibility. And that's what a republic is about, is a unique responsibility sometimes to go against the passions of the moment to do the right and honorable thing. Otherwise, we definitely wouldn't need to swear in on an oath and uh, because, you know, if you just are basically – you know, an internet poll and you just see where everybody's at and then you vote that way, we could actually eliminate Congress and just have like a virtual Congress thing, you know, and uh, but that's not what was ever intended. Yeah, just uh, uh, one one minute on that. Um, the first thing is it was a it was a genuinely courageous vote that you that you cast right. and almost literally courageous in the sense that you did what you believed was right, knowing there would be a cost to, do, to doing what's right. And of course, there there has been there's been a lot of blowback to that vote. Um, I think you made the right decision on any number of levels. Um, but this is really important, and it is for conservatives in, uh, essential to understand, which was your articulation that we're a republic, not a direct democracy. And if you go back, one of the founders of modern conservatism is Edmund Burke, and he, in his letter to the, to the citizens of Bristol, uh, said exactly that. He said, you have basically voted for me, hired me to reflect my conscience and to act as, as, uh, as I must and as I will, and I'll take into account what you say. But at the end of the day, I have to act with the integrity of what I believe. And if you don't agree with it, you can you can uh, take that up, you know, at the ballot box. And that was same true with with the same thing was true with James Madison, where he articulated in the Federalist Papers. The point is to refine and enlarge the public vision. And that's really what you need um, elected representatives to do. You need them to sort of filter through those passions, not simply reflect them. And real statesmen take the passions of the people, which always exist to one extent or another, and channel them in constructive ways rather than destructive ways. Yeah, and, and I'll just briefly add to that. One of the things I've noticed that I think has been part of the change in Congress, you know, congressional members just reflect really their districts, right? Because A, they elect them, and B, we obviously all want to get reelected. So, but the interesting thing is I think with the advent of initially talk radio and then the internet and then, you know, all these other sources, people now believe, and I'm not saying this in any bad or disrespectful way, they believe they have more of the story than you do as a member of Congress or that as a member of Congress, you have alternative motives, right? Yours is self-interest or whatever. So, you know, during the defund Obamacare years, when I would tell people, look, you can't shut down the government and defund Obamacare. It's just not like physically possible. Uh, they wouldn't believe me because, you know, uh, Sean Hannity or somebody said otherwise. And you're like, OK, well, I got it. But, you know, I do this. And that's, I think, where part of the issue is, is, you know, as as members of, the, of Congress, you know, we kind of are the filter a little bit and actually actually been inverted. You're listening to a Country First Conversation with Adam Kinzinger of Illinois. Our guest today is Peter Weiner, And if you've missed any of our other conversations, don't worry, we have them up for you. If you'd like to take a look, just go to countryfirst.com. That's with a one S-T in the URL, countryfirst.com. And they're also on our YouTube channel. So make sure that you subscribe and sign up for notifications today. And now back to our Country First Conversation. Peter, you know, you wrote almost two years ago to the day that you were politically homeless at the time. So let me ask you right now, how do you feel about that right now? Yeah, I'm, I'm still politically homeless. Um, if Adam Kinzinger's uh, vision of the party uh, takes place, I won't be politically homeless anymore. But uh, look, I was, um, you know, just to get my cards on the table, I've, I've been a lifelong Republican. My first vote for, for president was Ronald Reagan in 1980. And as you mentioned, I've worked in three Republican administrations. Uh, and um, and so I was a, both a card carrying member of the Republican Party. And I worked a lot of years of my life for the causes of the Republican Party and for presidents themselves. Um, but I broke from the party in 2016. Um, I wrote a piece in the New York Times, actually January 2016, um, that said I couldn't vote for Donald Trump uh, if he won the nomination under any circumstances. Um, and the reason that I that I said that was several fold. Um, one was uh, that I thought he was dangerous. I thought he posed a danger to the republic. Um, I believed uh, that he was a person who was um, uh, sociopathic. That that he that he was uh, uh, had a uh, disordered personality, and I felt like that 
that kind of psychological uh, for, uh, that psychological mindset combined with the power of the presidency, which I think I have some appreciation for, I thought was a real invitation for disaster. The other thing that I wrote about, it was not my main concern, but it was one of my concerns, is that I told Republicans, he's going to redefine the, the Republican Party. Uh, people who think there's a quick snapback from that uh, are mistaken. And, um, and that this party would change and what it would be at the end of a Trump presidency would be different than it was at the beginning of it. And I think that that has, that has happened. And apart from that, I felt like he was incompetent in policy. He had no interest. He was like stunningly indifferent to, 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 to policy. So I felt he was a malicious and malignant force. And uh, to use a phrase, I tried to put country first um, over, over the, the, uh, the party. Um, I'm still a conservative. You know, some people who have been critical of Trump who were conservatives broke. Uh, I think they were so traumatized by that experience that they, that they went toward the liber you know, liberalism. That, that's not my case. In the same way that I, I've pushed away some from the, from the, from the uh, uh, term evangelical, I'm still a Christian. Uh, my faith hasn't, hasn't wavered at all, but the evangelical movement itself, I think, has gotten conjoined with some, some really problematic elements. So I'm still a conservative. And in fact, one of the reasons I'm critical of Trump is not in spite of being a conservative, but because I am a conservative. Um, but as long as it's Trump's party, as long as it's defined by him or by Trumpism, um, I'm not comfortable there, but I'm also not willing to give up on the Republican Party either. Um, I think it's, it's important for the party's sake, and I think it's really important for the country's sake, that there be a sane, principled Republican Party and a, and a home for conservatism. And I would say right now, the Republican Party is not a home for, uh, for conservatives, so it's not a home for me. You know, and it's interesting because... I ask people, you know, as a Christian myself, I'll, I'll sometimes, you know, pose the question, uh, you know, do you think that Christianity's reputation today is better than it was prior to Donald Trump? And I don't, I, man, I can't imagine there's a lot of people with a straight face that would say, yes, it's better. So as a Christian, you know, you look at it and you're like, we, we need to be an example. We need to love, like love your neighbor above all else, right? And, you know, and love the Lord your God. And I'm like, did we do that on January 6th? I mean, yeah, they were singing hymns in the Senate, but I certainly don't think that's the kind of thing that, you know, attracts people to that belief. And, and you know, and as a party, I think if you go out on the street and you ask the average person, what is a conservative, right? They're going to tell you they want to build the wall or they want to cut taxes, right? It's, some of that's true, except that's not really what conservatism is. In my mind, conservatism just believes that a kid born in the inner city should have the same opportunity as a kid born in the wealthiest suburb. That's conservatism. And everything around that are tactics to get to that end state, but that's conservatism. And, you know, now it's just seen as angry, you know, old white guys basically that are throwing a fit that won't accept that January 6th was wrong, that blame it on Antifa. And uh, man, if anybody thinks that that is a recipe for victory in four years, uh, they're wrong. And, you know, part of the other problem, too, is you run into now, you know, I obviously uh, share a lot of what Peter is saying. And so I go out and I vote like a conservative and you get all the people that are like, oh, I thought you were different. You did? I mean, I'm a conservative. I just believe the most important thing right now is that the conservatives actually show what we're for. And I think people would be more attracted to it and would understand the heart. And it's not just anger, tactics, screaming, yelling. You know, I think, Adam, I think part of what people need to understand is what you're doing is motivated by this exodus that we're talking about of the Republican right. Party. The day after the insurrection, 3,200 people left the party. In Arizona alone, North Carolina, 3,000 the week after the Capitol attack, 2,100 the week after that. New York Times breaks it all down. But so what does all of this really mean when the dust settles for what the next year, two years, four years really look like? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Uh, I'll go first. I mean, we, we honestly we don't know uh, because we're in a state of flux. And anytime you're in a state of flux, uh, it's impossible to tell what's going to happen. Uh, I think the people who are giving up on the Republican Party at this point are doing it prematurely. And the reason I say that is we're still something like eight weeks after the Trump presidency. So there's going to be some attachment to it. And, and quite honestly, the base is inflamed uh, right now. 
there should be more self-reflection for what's gone on, um, both politically and morally. Um, but that's not the attitude uh, right now. There's just a lot of anger, a sense of wanting to own own the lips. Um, but hopefully with the passage of time, uh, things will calm down and cooler heads will prevail. I think there is a certain realism, which you were getting at, Matt, which is the Republican Party is a contracting party right now. And I'm not saying that as an opinion. I'm just saying that as a matter of fact. People are leaving the Republican Party. The Democrats right now have a double digit lead and favorability, uh, which is unusual. Uh, to have that kind of lead in American politics. Remember, Trump is particularly toxic among Gen Z and the millennial generation. They're on the cusp of becoming the dominant demographic group in the, um, in the country. And the Republican Party at a national level are 0 for 3 uh, after four years of Trump. They don't own the presidency. They don't have control of the House. They don't have control of the Senate. And uh, at some point that begins to sink, sink in. Now, this is complicated because um, the, tr the Republicans were not wiped out uh, in 2020. They gained seats in the House, they gained one governorship. So I think the task of creating a post-Trump party that was removed from Trump would have been helped you know, uh, if, if the Republicans had been wiped out, there would have been a cost to that, but just on this particular question that would have, that, that would have helped. Um, and there's still too much fear of what Donald Trump is uh, in the Republican Party. We saw that when, when uh, Kevin McCarthy went hat in hand to Mar-a-Lago uh, after having condemned Trump for, for his role in the January 6th in, insurrection. So it's complicated right now. But one thing that we know is if the Republican Party is going to recover, it's going to take leadership. It's going to take that voices like Adam Kinzinger to rise up and both to talk about what happened and where the Republican Party has to has to go, um, and you don't know when that'll work. You need the right people um, saying the right thing at the right moment, and sometimes you can say the right thing and the moment isn't ready. Uh, but at the same time, leadership create can create moments too, or they can accelerate moments, and that's really what we're in the process of of uh, of finding uh, finding out. This is a you have to be the, in this for the longer term, I would say. They're not going to be short-term solutions. As I said, you know, I had conversations with people who were publicly supportive of Trump during his presidency and afterward would say privately, you know, wow, that's over. Now we're going to have this quick snapback that I was referring to. And I said, no, that's not quite how it's going to work. It's going to take some time. Um, but it takes people of of, of courage and wisdom and prudence um, and discretion and insight to be able to make the case of what follows. Um, and um, I think those people exist and we're, we're talking to one of them um, and then we'll see what happens. Yeah, I think too, you know, it's uh, every day that goes by. I mean, you know, yesterday Donald Trump put out another statement about rhinos and all this stuff and don't give to the Republican party, give to me which is just a grift. I mean, it's a ridiculous grift. It's an attempt to maintain power. But I just feel like, and you know, I'm, I'm certainly biased, but I feel like every day that goes by, he becomes less and less relevant. And, you know, most, I, I remember we were so, I say we generically, we were so aggressive against, you know, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama for coming out after the presidency and having an opinion. This guy waited a whole never, you know, to do it. And now he's trying to inject himself back into the politics again. I think people are exhausted of it. I think, you know, they will be exhausted. I think the the kind of hangover of what happened will will really set in. And I think also when you program people to basically consider a man as God, right? Basically a religion putting putting man over frankly your your deep principles. Um, it takes time to come out of that, but I think it's going to be for a lot of people fast. And then there'll be some people, you'll always have that 20 or 30% that for them, it's about the culture war more than it is about any policy or principle or anything like that. Uh, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, the, uh, there is a concern that uh, uh, the uh, establishment oriented Republicans in the Senate, Blunt, Toomey, Portman, uh, Shelby and Burr are leaving. And they're, they're, uh, the people who are saying are people who were formed and shaped by the Trump era. Um, and that's, that's you know, an additional complication um, as, as well. I wish these people wouldn't stay. I wish they would stay and fight. I wish they would have spoken up uh, during the, during the Trump, Trump years. 
that doesn't mean that the task is is impossible in the way that you describe things, I think is right. I, I do think there's a hangover and you saw it to some extent in that CPAC poll. So, right, Trump's favorabilities are off the chart because these were core Trump supporters and only 55% said they would support him if he ran again. That didn't shock me. It was a lower number than I expected, but it wasn't substantially lower. And the reason is, uh, as, as I understand, at least some number of Trump supporters, their thinking is they feel deeply grateful for him, for his presidency, and they feel like he fought f f for them and for the causes they care about. And they simply will defend him against attacks uh, from, from, from liberals no matter what. So there's a sense of gratitude for him. I think it's obviously misplaced, but that's from their perspective. But that doesn't mean that they want him to stay around on the stage or that they themselves even weren't exhausted by the incessant conflict of those years. Um, and I think that if they're given half a chance, some number of them are going to want to turn the page and move move forward. You can't sustain that level of intensity and acrimony and hate in your political system uh, for, for forever. Um, at some point, the, the you know the, the the human brain can't can't sustain it, and the and the and the body politic can't sustain it. Yeah, and I think both parties are going to have to correct to, because you know half of Americans now identify as an independent. That's unsustainable. People, you know, they can go an election cycle or two feeling not represented, but eventually that changes. And, you know, it's it's and so I think that dynamic is at play. And also, look, the Republican base is not static. It can be dynamic. You know, we yeah, we gained millions of people that voted Republican for the first time under Donald Trump. We also lost millions and millions of people, most of whom live in the suburbs, et cetera. Those people are winnable again. But you got to have the right message of the right candidate. And when you stand up and you speak, this is my spiritual thing, saying it, it, everybody has darkness in their heart and light. And it's a constant battle every day to, to fight that fight. If somebody stands up and they speak the darkness, you know, racial undertones, fear, uh, watch out for the immigrants. They're going to steal everything. Uh, it gives you permission to let the darkness overtake you. And it feels really good because then you can just belong. You don't have to think. You can join a tribe. But that's where the real hard work is, is, you know, there's moments where I sit around and I'm upset by what's going on and I just want to fire out a tweet about, you know, anger and division stuff. But you realize that is the constant battle daily. You're listening to a Country First Conversation with Adam Kinzinger of Illinois. Our guest today is Peter Weiner, longtime speechwriter in Washington, longtime author, the Death of Politics, City of Man, Wealth and Justice, among the titles that he's written. You can go to our website, countryfirst.com. That's with a one S-T in the URL, countryfirst.com. And if you missed any of our other conversations, we have them up online. So if you'd like to take a look, go to our YouTube page, check them out. You can also make sure that you're following us on Facebook and Twitter as well. And now back to the conversation. you, Peter, just the idea of young uh, Republicans it not really having a, a, a true definition of what conservative uh, conservatism really is right now. How much is like this cause essentially hurt by just not having that definition out there for them to understand what they're talking about between what Trump is versus what conservatism is? Yeah, I think it I think it hurts a lot. I think it, um, it, it it's, it's interesting <laughs> at the jazz that because um, I don't refer to what is happening uh, to the Republican Party or even these, these Trump uh, acolytes as conservative. I refer to them as figures from, from the right because I really don't think they're conservative. Um, and I think one of the problems that's happened of, of many is that it's been the appropriation of the term conservatism and uh, fit into this sort of Trumpian moment, which, as I said, at best, I would say is a kind of angry populist, almost anti-institutional populist. I think actually the closest uh, resemblance that you have to, to what's happening on the kind of Trumpian right are the nationalist movements in Europe, uh, not, not, not the sort of Ronald Reagan conservatism that shaped the Republican Party. So I think that that has to, um, I, I believe it's important to defend terms and articulate terms. There are pedigrees to terms, there are histories to the conservative movement and what it means. It's a very impressive history. And it's not just a set of policy boxes. 
I mean, I understand conservatism both temperamentally and dispositionally. There's a certain conservative temperament of which part of it means uh, a kind of an epistemological humility by which it means that you, you know, conservatism, as I've always understood it, is very alert to human circumstances. It's stayed away from abstract ideology. And it basically tested again and again, how do these ideas fit in the real world? And how do you make adjustments and recalibrations in light of circumstances? You know, Aristotle used the imagery of a sailboat. You know, you, you know where, the distant, where, where the distant shore is and where you wanna go, but as you get there, there are winds and currents and you have to navigate within it. And, and that's just part of, you know, prudence. And then there's a, the disposition toward, um, uh, toward prudence. Uh, yeah. And so there, there's that. And then there's the philosophy of conservatism, which is uh, limited government, the idea that your natural rights come not from the generosity of state, but from the hand of God, as John Kennedy said in his inaugural address, um, and a, a whole series of philosophical propositions. And then there are public policy issues. Um, and that's where, you know, honorable people can disagree on what the particulars um, are. But that history, I think, is a relevant history. I think conservatism is always important to have because of what it brings to a country, including for liberals. I think li smart liberals, if you talk to them, know that for their own sake, for, for, to keep liberalism from being checked and going off. It needs a, a robust and serious conservative movement. So I think it's important for people to explain what it is. And I think for younger people, you know, they want to be part of a cause. They want to be part of something, to use another phrase John McCain made, made famous, which is uh, to be a part of something larger than themselves. And I still think that that animates people in politics. I think it should animate people in politics. And I believe politics is fundamentally about justice and the moral good and the common good. That's not all politics is about, you know, you'd be naive if you thought that, but that's fundamentally what it's about. So I think it's really important for people to speak up and to define both conservatism and the Republican party in a way that is aspirational and humane um, and talks about human flourishing in a way that can, you know, touch the moral imagination of younger, younger people, but not only younger people. For me, um, people sometimes will say, well, how come you mostly attack other Republicans and not the Democrats? And I'm like, because frankly, I believe, the, you know, as a Republican that our party is, is completely unmoored and that until we get moored back to principles, we'll have no effect. If I yell at a Democrat, all that's going to do is put us in our side. It's not going to convince anybody. But if I can, as a member of the family, say, look, we're off tracks, that's when, that's when it has an impact. And particularly with young people who I think would be attracted to the conservative message, not talking the social side of it, but when you look at you know, it's just, hey, we want a government that has a very, you know, important purpose, but it also is not overbearing in your life because we want you to go out and make your own choices, that kind of thing. And just 30 seconds on that, Adam. You know, if conservatism in the Republican Party is hollowed out, then I guarantee you the left is going to have free reign. That's why the task of revivifying, rebuilding the Republican Party is so important for its sake and for conservatism. Because if that doesn't happen, then there's not going to be a check on the on the uh, on the left. So you've got to people who care about the conservative party, the Republican movement, have to attend to their own house. Um, otherwise, this thing's going to come apart. One of the biggest things to understand is, uh, you know, in last week's conversation, we we had Jamie Winship, and he said, you know, humanity only has two natural fears. One is fear of falling and fear of loud noises. Everything else is learned. And we have learned in politics as well. We've learned that fear will raise you a ton of money and it'll make you famous. You know, if I stand outside, I could tweet something right. I don't know what my name recognition in the country is, but I know if I did a certain tweet, whatever that is, I could be at 100 percent immediately. And a lot of people know that trick, um, but that's not, you know, leadership. And so I think, how do you do it? You know, I wish there was a magic solution. I just think it's a couple of things in my mind. It's living by example of, of inspiration so that when people see it and hear it, they can feel the difference that they haven't seen in a long time. Uh, and I think it's calling out uh, fear as a tactic. It's just telling truth, right? You know, yeah, it's, it could have been very easy for me to say, yeah, we, we really don't know who attacked the Capitol on January 6th. 
but we do know, right? So I'm going to tell the truth. Yeah, it's going to make some people mad. But I think this, and it's the same with like Russian propaganda. You know, if you call it out and say, look, if if you get something in your text, you know, that says, for instance, this is one that everybody got, uh, you know, uh, I have eight friends that were in line for a COVID test. The line was too long. They didn't take it, but all eight of them got a result that it was positive. I know tons of people that got that email from a quote unquote close friend. None of that's true, but that was part of the whole COVID's not real scam. And uh, so I think it's calling that out, telling the truth and just living by example in another way. And I really hope that this is a moment and it will come eventually at least, but it's a moment where people will respond and be like, yeah, we're kind of tired of the old BS. Um, several things uh, related to Ronald Reagan. The first thing is, of course, you're right, he's an actor. I think the thing that gets um, uh, stressed uh, insufficiently when it comes to Reagan is he was a person who was deeply versed in conservative ideas. He was actually a very rare politician and president, which was he was a person who came to the movement sort of philosophically. Uh, he, I think he was a conservative before he was a Republican, if he were to rank that. And for him, the ideas really did matter. That was the, that was what 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 brought him in. The second thing is he was an actor, but he was not acting uh, in terms of 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 the you know shining city on the hill. Uh, you know anybody who knew Ronald Reagan or if you study him, that was his orientation, his disposition toward life, and his his politics was an expression of of that deeper sentiment, that deeper disposition, um, and. I think Republicans for way too long made a mistake in trying to simply appropriate the, the Reagan language. Great leaders find their own voice based on who they are as human beings of, of their life story, of the factors that have, that have shaped them, of, of, of their own disposition and, and, and temperaments. Um, and you, you also have to speak to certain moments. You can't take the rhetoric of 30 or 40 years ago and simply pull that template and apply it to the here and now because the situation now is is different. So that authenticity matters in, in political figures and, and you just have to, you have to speak uh, to it. But I do think that in the end to succeed, you have to be able to take a political movement and make it part of a story or a narrative, put it within the larger American context. And um, if you don't have that, if you just have a series of policy proposals no narrative, no story, story, nothing that touches the heart, not, uh, but rather just is focused on, on the cognitive, on the mind. I don't think in the end you really build a successful movement, uh, certainly not one that, that changes the course of events. You know, I have a, I have a, a good friend of mine who was the uh, finance chairman uh, of the McLean County, which used to be this just huge Republican apparatus uh, that has just, you know, atrophied. But he was the finance chairman, Muslim as well. And uh, under Donald Trump, he just left, left the party. He's angry. And, and I understand it because it was demonizing people, you know, for the purpose of getting cheap political points, you know. And so I would say, you know, my, my best advice that I have, and Peter may have, you know, something smarter to add, is just, you know, do be willing to have those intellectual discussions with people and don't feel like you have to identify with a party or with, you know, policies that you don't agree with. You don't have to go out and defend Republicanism, but you can say, hey, the Republican Party that I remember is X, Y, Z, right? It's talking about, hey, the Republican Party that, you know, I believe in was actually the one that, you know, after 9-11, you know, made a real effort to reach out to the Muslim community because understood that the only way to defeat radicalism is not going to be with a missile and a bomb, but it's with the community standing up against it. Just like when we talk about within Republicanism, the way to save it is not for Democrats to attack it, but for Republicans to stand up. And, uh, and I think just be willing to do that intellectual discussion and, uh, and, and, you know, old trick out of the playbook, say I'm a conservative, I'm not necessarily a Republican right now. So in my mind, I think that's, that's going to be very important. And I think, you know, understanding that our generation and younger basically is going to be the people that I think have to save the dialogue in this country and treat each other with respect. And interestingly, I was talking to a very smart person that told me that Clubhouse is actually a really good thing that's going to do that because people are listening to each other again. So, Peter, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that completely. Just one thing, uh, Eva, in terms of what, what I've learned um, in my years of experience, which is um, 
when you're having conversations with people that you disagree with, and this is true of theology and politics and every other area of human life, um, is that the people that you're talking about need to feel like they're being heard uh, and understood um, and respected rather than um, insulted. And it sounds like from you and your disposition of the call, that's not a problem with you, but just as a general matter, you know, 15 years ago, I had much more confidence in the ability to change people's mind by marshalling a whole series of facts, which I'm capable of doing. And I thinking that I can just sort of overwhelm people uh, to pull them into my position. And that doesn't work. And usually it causes them to dig in their heels more because they feel they're under attack. And I'd say, particularly in this political moment, I wouldn't underestimate the sense of, of core identity that is tied up into issues. When you're talking about issues, differences, you're not really talking about just issue differences. People feel like their core identity is tied up into it. And so it's extremely important even to be able to say, if you're talking to somebody, this is what I hear you saying. And to be able to say that to somebody, because if they feel hers, very much like, a, I would say like a marriage relationship or any other relationship, which is you need to feel like you're being heard, even if the person doesn't agree with you. And the sense of trust that people feel like this person is not out to, 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 to beat me or to savage me or to embarrass me, but that you have some standing in their life. Um, that doesn't mean that you're going to change those people's minds, but it does, in my experience, give you a kind of inroads to be able to, to uh, reach them in ways that otherwise you, one wouldn't be able to. The difference in terms of, you know, on the message, uh, how to reach out is, you know, as an example, I was chatting the other day on the floor with Danny Davis, who's a uh, African-American congressman from Chicago. He and I may have, uh, we, we may have very different, you know, views on, policy outcomes, but we were both talking about the challenges of the inner city. So he has a lot to teach me on that. I have a lot to teach him about the challenges in the rural community, which stunningly are very similar and, uh, you know, and would take some some certain, I think, same same results in terms of the alienation of people. You know, look, yeah, it's certainly a risk. And I think that's what a lot of people do out here is they say, well, if I lose my election, I won't be around to affect these other policy areas. And and you do have to take all that into account. But for me, it's gotten to the point where I said, look, if if we just save the Republican Party to save it and we're not out there actually fighting for values, what's the purpose of saving it and what would we be fighting for? So, uh, you know, I'm at peace with the outcome no matter what. Uh, I know my wife is at peace with the outcome no matter what, and uh, it's nice to be able to sleep at night, do our best, and and know that, uh, you know, Country First has grown, ex you know, a lot, and I don't intend to go lobby after this if I would lose. <laughs> Peter, you have any final thoughts before we wind things down here? No, I, I well, yes, I guess I do, which is... Um, obviously, if you're a Republican, um, this is a difficult uh, moment. Um, but, um, you know, when I got involved in politics, and my interest in politics were um, going back to, to when I was in, uh, in high school, I cared more about sports than politics, but, but, but it mattered to me. Um, and I got involved uh, because I did feel like politics mattered, as I said earlier, because it involved justice. Um, and I was never cynical about politics then, and I'm not cynical about politics now. And I think there's just too much at stake to become cynical or to become indifferent. Um, politics is a way that you can change uh, the way that the direction of the world. It's not the only way that it happens. Um, and most of politics is fairly prosaic, um, but there are moments of great moral gravity that happen in the life of a nation and politics speaks to that. And, um, and there's too much uh, that, that, that matters for people to, 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 uh, to check out. Uh, there's a, you know, you, you can, you can prove the possible by the actual, and there are actual moments in American history um, after periods of great difficulty um, where, uh, where the country has gotten back on track and done, and done great things. And, um, and I think it's important for everybody, um, young people and people of every generation uh, to know that, that, we, you know, we have the capacity f to write the next chapters in the American story. Um, and, um, and it's not going to be done if people don't stand up. That's why I'm glad that uh, the representative Kinzinger and others are doing, uh, doing that. And uh, there's no guarantee of success, uh, but there's honor in trying uh, and doing what's right. And that should be enough. 
That's right. Well, Peter, it's uh, it's an honor to have you and uh, you know your your writing, your demeanor, the things you have continued to fight for. Uh, it's it's an honor to be able to have you on board and. And uh, certainly, I think the people listening today were better for having heard from you and appreciate it. And you're handsome, you know, on top of that, too. So, just so. devilishly <laughs> handsome. Absolutely. <laughs> the the, the uh, checks in the mail, as they say, it was great to be on with <laughs> with uh, with uh, with you guys. And uh, Matt, that's impressive. Eureka College. Not many people could come, could come up uh, with uh, with that one. So I enjoyed the conversation. I probably drove through there to go to Amboy for a basketball game once or twice. I don't know. So these things are the ones that stick with me. I can't empty the dishwasher, but I remember that. Thank you, guys. It's been fun. We want to thank everyone who's joined us today. And as we've mentioned before, this is just the beginning of a series of conversations that Country First will be hosting on the need to put country over party. We invite you to join the website. Go take a look, countryfirst.com. That's with a one S-T in the URL, countryfirst.com. Make sure you subscribe to receive all of the latest updates. All of our podcasts can be found there and on our YouTube channel as well. And make sure you get a chance to watch and share on your social media channels today as well. My name is Matt Rodewald, and we will see you next time as we put country over party.